Welcome to our discussions of soundness and completeness. We learned a little bit about the proof techniques that we're going to be using for purposes of this course, and we're going to use soundness and completeness to show exactly how that's supposed to work, some examples of the way in which we use mathematical induction in particular. So soundness and completeness is what we are going to be using. Uh, we'll do soundness first, followed by completeness. It's a bit more complicated. First, a system of logic is sound just when everything provable is semantically valid. It's complete when everything semantically valid is provable. More precisely, we use a single turnstile and a double turnstile to describe these relationships. So the single turnstile means something is provable. The double turnstile means something is semantically valid. So soundness goes from a single turnstile for a formula to a double turnstile. Completeness goes from a double turnstile to a single turnstile. And the proof technique that we're going to use is primarily mathematical induction. For soundness, we'll use induction on the length of a proof in question. Remember, mathematical induction, we have to figure out some way of quantifying what we're talking about. So for proofs, it's easy. Just how many steps does the proof take? And you've got a one-step proof being the base case. So first, let's talk about soundness. When we look at the base case for proving soundness, we pay a penalty because we're using a natural deduction proof system rather than an axiomatic one. So we have a number of basic rules of proof to tie to semantic validity for each base case, two for each connective. If we wanted to use an axiomatic system like the one we find in CIDR, things would be much simpler because all we'd need is modus ponens as a rule and then the axiom schemas that we find in the CIDR book. But we're not doing that, so we're going to use the rules that we learned for the natural deduction system. That means it will take a bit more work. So the base case involves showing that each axiom is semantically valid if we were doing an axiomatic system. For example, consider the first one. For it to fail to be semantically valid, there needs to be some model M on which the valuation relative to that model for the formula in question is zero. For that to be the case, the antecedent of the conditional would have to be true in other words, get assigned a valuation of 1, and the valuation for the consequent would have to be 0, which is false. For the latter to be the case, the valuation for its antecedent, the antecedent of that formula, would have to be 1, and the valuation of its consequent would have to be 0. But that can't be true while that's true. It's the same formula. The valuation is 1 in one case, 0 in another. That's a contradiction. So that would establish the semantic validity of the first axiom scheme. By the way, I should point out this is a special symbol. This is called the Falsum cons constant. It's just an upside down T. It stands for a contradiction, an instance of P and not P.
the inductive case then, after you've established the base case, would only require showing that the rule modus ponens is valid. And we'll show how simple that is to prove as part of the inductive case that we're going to use for our own natural deduction system in the next section. So we're not using an axiomatic system. Let's talk about what we do with the natural deduction system. To show the base case for natural deduction systems, it's simple, but it's tedious. The induction is on the length of a proof, and a proof of length 1 isn't a valid proof except when the line is itself an assumption. In such a case, semantic validity could fail only if the assumption had a value of 1, and the line itself a value of 0. But since the two are the same, the assumption and the rule in question, the assumption of semantic invalidity generates a contradiction immediately. So the base case is not hard. We prove the inductive case by strong induction on the length of the proof. In particular, we assume that every proof from the premises in question, using the rules we are allowed to use, of length n minus 1 is semantically valid, and we will show it follows that every proof of length n is also semantically valid. So the idea here is we have a proof. We don't know how long it is. It doesn't matter how long it is. But we assume every step up until the last one is semantically valid. And then we have to show that the last step has to be semantically valid as well. Doing so requires enumerating the possible rules to be used for the last step of the proof and then showing that this last step has to be semantically valid as well. If our system were axiomatic, we'd have much fewer rules to worry about, but we've got basically 10 for propositional logic. For natural deduction systems, we undertake the tedious task of examining each rule and demonstrating its semantic validity. For example, just take wedge introduction. We assume that the valuation of phi is 1, and for reductio that the value of phi or psi is 0. Now notice what I'm doing here. Remember, Wedge introduction is this rule. From phi, you can derive phi or psi. Psi can be anything you want it to be. So, I'm assuming that this proof rule is semantically invalid. In other words, I'm going to assume that the valuation of the premise is 1, but the valuation of the conclusion is 0. That's what this line is telling us. That's what I'm doing. So I'm assuming we have a proof rule, but that it's not a semantically valid one. Okay, let me get rid of that stuff so that we can see what I'm talking about. For the reductio assumption to be correct, we'd need the valuation for the model on phi to be 0 and the valuation for the model on psi to be 0. In other words, you can't have that be true without that and that to bo both be true. That comes just from the definition of the wedge from the truth table that we use to define what the wedge connective stands for. So, contradiction. 
That means if the last step of the proof were wedge introduction, the assumption that a proof of length n goes wrong at the very last step because of wedge introduction not being semantically valid, that's a mistake. We can prove that that would generate a contradiction. So wedge introduction is one rule where the semantic validity of the premise guarantees the semantic validity of the conclusion from it. Now this process is rather long and tedious because you have to do the same sort of thing for every single connective, both for the introduction and for the elimination rules. We have to do the same thing for wedge, ampersand, double arrow, and arrow, single arrow. Notice I didn't put the negation in there, but we have to do that too. The only complications come in dealing with the assumption rules. How do we demonstrate the inductive case for these rules? So what I'm telling you is, if you think about the way this proof worked up here, to establish that wedge introduction is semantically valid, you can do the same thing for the other six rules that don't involve making assumptions. For wedge elimination, you just assume that the two premises were true, but that the conclusion was false, and then you'd show how that generates a contradiction. Same thing for all of the other rules, except for the assumption rules. How are we going to deal with those? For the non-assumption rules, it's just a matter of running through each one and showing the semantic validity of it. So the assumption rules are the two versions of RAA and arrow introduction. For RAA steps, notice that what we're trying to prove is that the last line of the proof, line n, is semantically valid given the assumption that all previous lines of the proof are semantically valid. Since the previous lines involve a contradiction, there's no model no interpretation available that satisfies the assumptions made, and so trivially there can be no countermodel to the last step of the proof. Let me try to explain that a little more simply or in a different way that might help. In order to assume that the form of argument being used is semantically invalid, you assume that all of the premises are true, but that the conclusion is false. RAA works by finding a contradiction and then deriving the opposite of some assumption that you've made. So when RAA is applied, it's impossible for all of the premises to be true because you've already got a contradiction there. So that gives us the capacity to give a very simple argument for both versions of RAA, that the step involving the application of that rule as the last step of a proof of length n can't be faulty. It cannot be semantically invalid. Our last one is for arrow introduction. For that rule, our question has the following form. We assume that the n minus one-th step is an instance of gamma union phi implies psi. And we want to show that gamma semantically guarantees phi arrow psi. That's what we're doing. Let me slow down here because it's important to understand this particular part 
and in particular, what I said about the form of an arrow introduction rule. So when you've got arrow introduction, the step before you apply arrow introduction has a conclusion. Psi. That's the formula at the preceding step, and then once you apply arrow introduction, you end up with a conditional. And the conditional has to have as its antecedent a formula that's one of the premises that you had in the prior steps. So all of that is true, accurate in characterizing, and then everything else is just wrapped up in this big set gamma of other premises. It doesn't matter what these other premises are. What matters is you have derived psi at n minus one step. You have phi as a previous premise somewhere. Notice it also has to be an assumption, but that's not relevant here. All that matters is it has to be one of the premises that was being used to derive psi. And then you leave all of the other premises in place and you write down the arrow formula. Okay, that's how arrow introduction works, formally speaking. So let's assume that there's something wrong with that form of argument. That would mean this is okay, but this isn't. Then the, what will that get us from our model? It will generate the following assignments. The valuation for gamma will be 1. The valuation for phi will be 1. And the valuation for psi will be 0. That's what it would take for that semantic validity claim to fail. Notice, however, that that result contradicts our assumption for the inductive case that the proof through line n minus 1 is semantically valid. So notice the proof had that from gamma and phi we could derive psi. And we assumed for the inductive case that every step through n minus 1 was semantically valid. So what that tells us is the single turnstile at step n minus 1 also guarantees the double turnstile at n minus 1. Well, if that's true, notice what the semantic validity claim gets you. If the single turnstile can be turned into a double turnstile, then this will be assigned a value of 1, this formula assigned a value of 1, and that formula assigned a value of 1. But that last point contradicts what we had to assume when we were trying to demonstrate that something goes wrong at step n in the proof. So now we have demonstrated soundness because the proof is long and tedious, but it's relatively trivial. The important thing is we learn that the system is sound in this way because we have mathematically precise accounts of the relevant 
crucial conceptual elements involved in the proof. This is an important feature, a very important feature of a logical system. A logical system that is unsound is really in trouble. So that's how the proof of soundness goes. How does the proof of completeness go? We're going to do the same sort of thing. We're going to use mathematical induction. But things are going to be much more complicated. So let me move ahead to the entire stuff on this screen. And let's talk about it. What are the key elements we need for completeness? So remember, first, for completeness, we're trying to go from a double turnstile this time to a single turnstile. So that's the first point. We want to prove if a formula is semantically valid, it's provably true. It can be proved in our system. Our proof is going to rely on three crucial things. First, a key lemma, a consistency theorem, and something called Lindenbaum's lemma, named after Lindenbaum, not surprisingly. So before we get to these three key elements, we're going to define what consistency is. A set of sentences, gamma, is consistent if and only if you can't prove a contradiction from that set. Gamma doesn't prove the falsum constant. That's our definition of consistency. The key lemma says this. If you join a formula to gamma and the union of those two sets is inconsistent, that means that gamma proves the opposite of what you put together with it. This is an if and only if claim. I just expressed it in one direction. But given our definition of inconsistency, the key lemma will be this. You can prove the falsity of a formula if and only if the union of that formula with gamma is inconsistent. We can rephrase our key lemma in more formal terms. So T union phi proves falsum if and only if I said T. This is a gamma. It kind of looked like a T. Let me start over. So we're going to re-express our key lemma this way. If gamma union phi proves falsum, then gamma proves not phi, and the reverse direction as well. It's an if and only if claim. That's going to turn out to be useful to have this formal characterization of our key lemma, replacing the language of inconsistency with the terminology that I just used. If you think about our two versions of RAA, we might call them tilde intro and tilde elim. You can see that this lemma is pretty trivial. So if you think about what you're doing when you're doing an RAA argument, you're basically applying one direction of the key lemma. You have some premises that prove a contradiction because there's an instance of P at one line and an instance of not P at a different line. So you have that. 
and then you get to derive from that that gamma proves the opposite. And you could run the explanation the other way. If gamma proves the opposite, then if you conjoin phi, the unnegated formula, you're going to be able to prove a contradiction. Okay, so the key elements in the proof are we want our key lemma. Our key lemma ties the notion of in inconsistency to proving the opposite, the provability of the opposite. We're going to want a consistency theorem and then Lindenbaum's lemma. So we have the key lemma first. Let's look at the consistency theorem. The theorem says that if gamma is a consistent set of sentences, then it has an interpretation. There is some interpretation or model for gamma. Note that if we have this theorem, if we have this consistency theorem, we can give a very straightforward, very simple proof of completeness. So let me skip ahead so we have the whole proof in front of us. There we go. Now remember, before I go through the proof, here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to show that if gamma proves phi, sorry, if phi semantically follows from gamma, if gamma semantically validates phi, then gamma proves phi. So that's what we're doing. So the first thing you do, obviously, is suppose that phi is semantically valid given gamma. Then gamma union not phi has no interpretation. By the contrapositive of the consistency theorem, if gamma is a consistent set of sentences, then it has an interpretation. So if it has no interpretation, then it's inconsistent. So by the contrapositive of the consistency theorem, gamma union not phi is inconsistent. Now, go back to the key lemma. If gamma union not phi is inconsistent, then gamma proves not not phi. And not not phi just is phi. So, we can go from the semantic validity claim to the provability claim very simply if we have the consistency theorem. That means most of the work that we're going to have to do is making sure we understand how to prove the consistency theorem. The key to proving the consistency theorem is Lindenbaum's lemma. So we have a definition of consistency. We have a key lemma that ties the notion of consistency and inconsistency to provability in a certain way. And then we have a consistency, consistency theorem. And if we can get all of those things in place, we'll have a very simple proof. We need Lindenbaum's lemma, though, to establish the consistency theorem. So the key to proving Lindenbaum's, proving the consistency theorem is Lindenbaum's lemma, which says the following. Start with a set of consistent statements, gamma, again. 
Then we're going to make this much bigger. We're going to turn it into gamma star. In doing so, what we're going to do is add stuff to it in terms of clauses that are going to look very familiar to you. So if, look at A. If and only if phi is in gamma star, not phi isn't. We have to do that to make sure that we don't generate an inconsistency here. So what we're trying to do is construct a consistent superset from gamma. And if we let the opposite of any formula that's in gamma into gamma star, we would of course not have a consistent set at all. So what we're doing is we're going to add a whole bunch of formulas. First one says, if phi's in gamma, then you can't put not phi in gamma star. If phi isn't in gamma, then you do put not phi in gamma star. So clause A tells us that one of the two is going to be in gamma star. For every formula whatsoever in the language, one of the two is going to be in gamma star. And then the next three, four clauses just tell us when you've got other connectives, the binary connectives, you just use the usual truth clauses for those connectives to decide what else to put in gamma star. So you've got a whole bunch. Th think for a moment about how this would work. Start with clause A again. One of those two for atomic formulas is going to be in gamma star. Then, after you've got the atomic formulas in place, you apply the other binary connective clauses in the usual way. So, when do you have a conjunction in there? Well, you have it when both of the conjuncts are in there. When do you have a disjunction in gamma star? When you have one or the other of those formulas in there. When do you have an arrow? Well, when either the antecedent isn't in there or the consequent is. And when do you have a double arrow? Well, when you've got the single arrow running in both directions, then you get the double arrow. Notice those are very familiar clauses about each of those connectives. And what they do is they establish that gamma star is consistent so long as gamma was, because these are the ones that follow the accounts of semantic validity that we have for each of the connectives. So now we have a superset, gamma star. We have gamma, which could have had hardly anything in it, and now we turn it into gamma star. The closure for negation is ensured by the fact that gamma is consistent, so constructing a superset that meets the closure requirement is consistent. For each successive clause, take any complex formula and add it to gamma, whatever it takes to make the closure clause hold. Laying all this out precisely takes a long time, so we'll just settle for doing it in a relatively sketchy way. So once we do it the way we talked about, I told you how to do it for atomic formulas that get added to gamma. But of course, not just atomic formulas. Once you have a disjunction in place, then you can also have conjunctions of disjunctions and 
conditionals involving disjunctions. So it doesn't apply just to atomic formulas. But you can see how the pattern is supposed to go. So we're going to call this gamma star set a maximally consistent set. This is a Henkin style proof um, after, named after Henkin. Is that the closure properties in the Lindenbaum's lemma are designed specifically to give us the material to build an interpretation of the set in question. We're wanting an interpretation of set gamma, because remember set gamma is a consistent set, and the consistency theorem says if it's a consistent set, then it has an interpretation. So we're constructing this maximally consistent set to make it really obvious and easy to see how to build an interpretation of the maximally consistent set. And then once we have an interpretation of the maximally consistent set, we're going to find out that it's also an interpretation of the original set that we started with. So if gamma star is such a maximally consistent set, then it has an interpretation. So you start with every atomic formula, phi of the language. There's an interpretation that gives us a model M such that the valuation for phi is 1 if and only if phi is in gamma star. Remember, we've got gamma star being maximally consistent, so it's either got phi in there or it doesn't have phi in there. So if we're talking just about atomic formulas, the valuation will be 1 if and only if that formula is in gamma star. So if it's 0, then phi isn't in gamma star and not phi is in there instead. Now if you remember, given that we have a truth functional logic at this le level, if you just set up the truth values for all the atomic formulas of the language, you automatically have an interpretation for any set of sentences whatsoever, and that's what gamma star is doing for us. We can prove this lemma, call it the model existence lemma, by induction on the complexity of formula. So now we're finally in a position to see how mathematical induction is going to turn out to help us establish what seems obvious to us. What seems obvious is once you establish the truth values for all the atomic formulas of a language, given that it's truth functional, everything else will follow. We're going to now prove that by induction on the complexity of the formulas involved. So assume we have a maximally consistent superset of gamma, gamma star, and we aim to show that we can construct an interpretation, a model for it, such that the valuation on the model for a formula in that language is 1 if and only if that formula is in gamma star. The base case is suppose that phi is an atomic formula itself. Since gamma star is consistent, it can't have both this formula and its negation in it, so it's easy to construct an interpretation that satisfies the description given. Now, for the inductive case, suppose that phi has a complexity of measure n. We understand the complexity of measure n in terms of the number of connectives involved. So if phi is a simple disjunction, the measure is 2. If phi is a disjunction of two disjunctions, then it has a measure of 3, and so on. n can be as large as you want, but we understand it in terms of the number of connectives involved in the formula itself. We assume that all of the immediate subformula psi satisfies the closure requirements in the lemma and thus have an interpretation. 
Why do we assume that? Well, because we're trying to prove something in the inductive case by mathematical induction, which means we assume that it holds for the n minus 1 case, and we derive that it holds for the n case. So the n case is the measure that we're assuming that phi has. So for everything else short of n, short of the last connective that we added, we assume there isn't any problem. We then prove, once we assume that n minus 1 works fine, has an interpretation, we then prove that phi also satisfies this requirement by considering each possibility in turn for what the connective could be. The final connective could be a negation, a conjunction, a disjunction, a conditional, or a biconditional. In each case, we appeal to the relevant closure principle for the connective that it is a woof and that it has evaluation when its subformulas have evaluation to show that phi 2 has evaluation on the interpretation in question. Notice that would be easy to do because let's just take some examples. So suppose that phi is the negation of psi. Then Psi is not in gamma star by the inductive assumption, and so our inter interpretation assigns it a zero, and thus assigns its negation a one. So the valuation for phi is one if and only if phi is in gamma star. Try another example. Suppose the last step is really a conjunction. The last connective is a conjunction. So assume that phi is the conjunction of psi and chi. Then both of these are assigned a 1 by our valuation function generated by our inductive assumption. And our interpretation assigns 1 to both of them. And thus, the valuation assigned to phi is 1 if and only if phi is in gamma star, our maximally consistent superset. We do the same thing through the remainder of the connectives, thus establishing the inductive clause, that if everything is fine at formulas that have length n minus 1, then everything will be fine for formulas at length n as well. So we began with a consistent set. We built a superset of it with the closure principles in question, the Lindenbaum lemma method. From this superset, our model existence lemma lets us build an interpretation of this maximally consistent superset. Since our original set is a subset of this superset, it follows that our interpretation of the superset is also an interpretation of our original set. So any consistent set has an interpretation, and the proof of this claim from this claim to completeness is simple. It's the same one that I showed you in an earlier slide, but Let's just look back at it. Let me put the whole thing up. There it is. The consistency theorem says if gamma is consistent, then it has an interpretation. That's what we just proved, and it relied essentially on mathematical induction to do the proof. Once we have the consistency theorem established, using Lindenbaum's lemma to do so, we now have a straightforward proof of completeness.
So suppose that gamma semantically validates phi. Then gamma union not phi has no interpretation. By the contrapositive of the consistency theorem, gamma union not phi is inconsistent. So by the key lemma, gamma proves not not phi, which is the same thing as gamma proves phi, since a double negation cancels out. Thus, if gamma semantically validates phi, then gamma proves phi for any phi including the empty set. So if phi is semantically validated, phi is provable.